Welcome to the show, folks. This is Wrestling Changed My Life. Here we go. I, I think that loss was good for me because, as I said in this room, I, mean, I was crying, you know. I was crying. Not, not that I got beat because I lost. You know, it wasn't. I mean, there's a difference, right? It, it wasn't. So the difference is he didn't kick my butt. I, I kind of beat myself. We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the, the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's, it's 5% of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit, humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back my time, I spent wrestling. If it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Welcome back to the show, my friends. This is the one I've been waiting for for quite some time. My guest today is TJ Williams. For those of you who know me, I grew up in Illinois. TJ Williams, along with his brother Joe, were absolute legend status, and I've been dying to have this interview. So here's what we chat about. TJ came up through the Harvey Twisters, one of the great youth clubs in the country. Then he went to Mount Carmel High School, which was a powerhouse back in the 90s. The 1993 Mount Carmel team had six future NCAA champions on it. TJ's older brother Joe was a senior. He was a three-time champ. TJ was a freshman. He was a two-time national champ. Then you also had Tony Davis who was a freshman, who went on to be a national champ. Ironically, T.J. Williams and Tony Davis wrestle in the NCAA Finals years later. It's an incredible story. We talk about that as well. And folks, let's just get to it. Sit back, get the popcorn going, get yourself a little soda, a little quarantine soda, and let's get ready for it. My fan of the week is Asher, Little Wrestler 13 on the gram. He's wrestling for Eastern Iowa Wrestling Club. My man Topher Carton is his coach. We love you, Asher. Thank you for listening, and keep on keeping on, brother. Folks, this episode is brought to you by Gable the Goat Part 2. It's a documentary podcast on one Dan Gable, covering the years 1987 through 1993. It's episode 109 in the feed, I believe. 109, 110, somewhere in there. You'll see it, but I would greatly appreciate you listen to it if you haven't done so already. Gable the Goat Part 2. And that's it, folks. Let's give it up for TJ, the Harvey Twister, Williams. Peace. So let's get into it. TJ Williams, how are you this morning, sir? I'm doing good. How about you, Ryan? Hey man, I'm actually enjoying this whole quarantine. It gives me more time to do stuff like this. So I've I've just been getting ready for <laughs> getting ready for this. I've been putting some questions out there on Twitter. We got some folks who want to ask you a few questions that we'll get to at the end, man. But let's just start at the very beginning. 1981, Steve Williams goes to the Harvey Twisters for the first time. When was your first memory of stepping foot in the Harvey Twister complex? Man, um, I don't even remember when I first started. I can only guess I was around maybe seven or eight, maybe nine years old when I started. And what so. do you remember from those early days, man? Everyone everyone knows, you know, I, I talk about the Harvey Twisters every chance I can get on this podcast because I grew up in the farmland out in Geneseo, Illinois, and whenever we'd go to IKWF State and we'd see Cameron Lloyd, Cartis Lloyd, Mario Morgan with the red jumpsuits on, I was, like, just so yeah. intimidated at the time. But <laughs> So now that I'm older, I, I get to talk to all these guys, but, I mean, Obviously, Joe was a, was a two-time state champ in IKWF and probably led the way for you and kind of dragged you along. But what are your first? What are some of your memories of those workouts in there with with Coach Quint? Well, to be honest, Ryan, when I first started, I mean, I was getting my butt kicked. I mean, I was getting my butt kicked so bad. 
because back then there was there was three levels, right? There was the midget level, there was the JV level, and there was the varsity level. I think I started out with the midgets, and then I kind of worked my way up. And I remember being a uh, junior varsity, and you know back then that's when you had dual meets, right? On doing like the weekday, then tournaments on the weekend. So we would have certain dual meets with certain teams, you know. And then they would always bump me up to varsity, and I'd go out there and get my butt kicked, <laughs> <laughs> you know. And and I mean that wasn't nice, but it was just the price you have to pay if you wanted to be to be a good wrestler, you know. So um, when I started out, I started out getting my butt kicked, but then as I grew, I eventually started getting better and better. And our room was so tough that every every practice was like a like you're wrestling for a state title, you're wrestling for like a national title, you're wrestling for the AAU nationals. So, you know, we had guys in a room that can challenge you, and there would be times where you might only get a handful of takedowns that that practice. <laughs> you know, but that yeah, I mean, I remember getting my butt kicked in practice and and crying going home and crying and man like you know just like these kids do now it's like they right. think they had a bad i will i will cry in practice and my coach but you know coach quint like stop crying it's like i can't get a takedown you know <laughs> dude what um, about tony davis back in those days was he was he a phenom because he was about the same age as you right yeah uh, tony davis was tony davis didn't come to practice a lot i tell you that but when he came to practice, I mean, he was just so funky, and it was just so natural to uh, to him. He would, you know, like you would wrestle him, and he'd just do all these little funky rolls, like he practiced it, but he never did. <laughs> it just came natural, you know. And and then and then I would sit there and look at him, like, man, how how you come in here taking this guy down when I I've been in here a half a year ain't and and not taking this guy down at all. He said, I, I don't know. So, but yeah, Tony, man, Tony was an athlete and he was, he was special, you know, he was special. But when, when it was time to work hard later on in the season, he came to practice every day and worked his butt off, you know, man, and, I, and Tony and I, oh no, go ahead. I was just going to say, I tell people all the time and they get sick of me talking about it, but man, at that time you had. Joe, your brother, obviously, four-timer. You were a four-timer. Tony, I think he only won it once, but obviously he had that battle with Reggie Wright, and he could have won it a couple times. You had David Douglas. I mean, how many guys were in that freaking room at the time, man? Blakely? Woo. Man, we had, like, like, yeah, like the ones you named. Then we had some of the older uh, twisters, T.C. Danzler, Terry Danzler. Um, man, it was... Was it Charles was so Lloyd many. older than you or younger than you? Charles Lloyd was younger than me. He he was around um, Cassio and who else? A uh, Cassio Perro's age mm-hmm. and maybe and uh, BJ's age, BJ okay. Petrell. So yeah, that was that era right there. Yeah, and but, so now that you're a coach, I mean, what looking back at those practices, everyone knows. It's uh the doors are closed, man. No one's gonna know what's going on in there, and I don't want you to spill any trade secrets here. But now that you're a coach, what do you think they did that got kids to just perform at this level year in and year out? Um, I, I think for one, you know, the coach demand respect, you know, and that's something a lot of. I'm not gonna say every club kind of don't have that but a lot of clubs don't really have that it's, it's all about me trying to recruit you to come to my club because you're good and I don't want to put the work in but back in our day it was our coach demanded respect and he demanded you come in here you work hard you know and if you do it wrong well you're going to you know you're going to do it again until you get it right and plus he cared for us too it wasn't like he wanted us just to win, 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 and that's all he cared about, you know. But we we worked hard. You know, we worked hard, and a lot of times, 
you know, when you go to these tournaments, um, things wasn't fair because you were a Harvey Twister. So that made us even better, you know. So we, so we did the double work. You saw that even we, back then, huh? Oh man, yeah. It it was as a kid, you you really don't experience it because you, you know, because you're out there wrestling and you just listening to your coach, you know. But the more and more you participate in wrestling, and the more you understand it. And the more you watch it, you know, you start seeing like, man, that was, man, that was, I thought that was two takedowns. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> oh, it wasn't? Oh, okay, it wasn't? All right, well, I, I'll go get a takedown again. I'll go get another one to make sure that this is two. You know, and I think that's what, that's what made us a lot, you know, that's what made us better. One of the, one of the things that we had to face was, dealing with that adversity of just not getting the calls that we should have got. And and that's with, you know, that's with every, every club. Right. You know, it wasn't just the Harvey Twisters, but predominantly I think it was the Harvey Twisters, but, but now you see it all across the state, all, all across the nation, you know, and it's just like, I feel like you got to be liked by somebody to, get the calls you need or you tell your guy to go out there, hey, get everything you can. Make sure you secure your takedown. Make sure you don't give up anything because if you get something up, it's going to be kind of tough to get that back, especially if you don't get the call. Yeah, and back then, I mean, at least when I was through there, most of the big clubs, to your point, were – we're recruiting kids, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that because you want the best kids in the room, but there's a difference between right. that and developing champions from within, which obviously the Twisters did. But you also got to realize, um, and not you, but the people listening, there's like a set schedule of IKWF tournaments, and the Twisters would go to like three of the ten. They'd go to the ones they wanted to, and that was it. So you might not see them for a month at a time. Then out of nowhere, shit, they're at the Midwest Classic. And... You know, so they didn't right. really play ball with everybody else, like you're saying. Like they didn't go to all the tournaments all the time, and so, um, you know, there was some animosity there, no doubt. Um, and and yeah. the other thing is, like, who was actually teaching the technique? Was it Quint out there, like doing the double legs, or did he have guys showing at that level? <laughs> Man, it was. Um, well, to answer that first question, back in my era, we we wrestled every Sunday. In, in Illinois somewhere, mm-hmm. you know. So it wasn't it wasn't until later on I think things I think people started wising up and say, Hey, I'm recording these guys <laughs> and uh <laughs> trying to figure out how to beat them, you know. So I think back in my day we, we you know, we would do dual meets on the weekday and then tournaments on the weekend. And it was some tough tournaments. You're talking about the the Panther Invitational, the Oak Forest Tournament, um, the Tinley Park Tournament. I mean, it was it was the Peoria Tournament. There was tough tournaments every weekend, you know. Mm-hmm. And then I think, and then I think later on, you know, people started, "Hey, how's this guy doing this move? Ain't nobody doing this move, but now he's doing it." So I think uh, the coaching staff realized that, hey, you know. The more you wrestle every weekend locally, the more people can record and, and pick up certain things from you to try to beat you, you know. Right. So, um, but, yeah, but in, in, the, in, in, in the practice room, you know, Coach Quint or the other coaches will um, show technique, you know. And then, you know, just like – just probably like your club – somebody would show technique and then other guys would work on it. And then you would just kind of do a live or continue to drill or drill it down to a T where you can do it with your eyes closed, you know? Mm -hmm. Did they let parents in the room back then? No, no parents wasn't allowed. And I think that was a good thing because um, even before I started coaching, you know, I would go to certain clubs and I see the parents, I mean, sometimes the parents, like, in the circle with the kids, <laughs> you know, and, and it's like, hey, you, or you want this kid to beat 
this kid or are you trying to get kids better? Because if you're just about your kid, then I think you shouldn't be here. But that was my thought from the outside looking in, you know, but I just think some of these parents are so, I mean, living vicariously through their kids. Not, not all of them, but just a handful. And that's a big handful versus just, Hey, you know what? Let the coaches do their job. That's what you pay for. Right. Right. You know, you pay these coaches to help your kid. And then when he's done with practice, you may ask him how was practice, you know, but you know, some of these parents don't want that. I mean, I think some of these parents want their cake and eat it too. Right. They want to watch practice. They want to participate in practice. And then they want to tell their kid what they need to do. And and some of these parents are right and a lot of them are wrong. But then when it you know, when it gets to a tougher match, right? Okay, now that hey, can you coach my kid? It's like, well, you've been coaching them all season. <laughs> you know? <laughs> now you want him to listen to me. So I, I I don't know. I just think some parents just need to let the coaches do it, right? Because when these guys get to college Who's coaching them? The college coaches. Right. You know, now there, there's nothing wrong with a parent cheering from the stands, hey, get your shot, or, you know, stay in good position, you know, things like that. But not like, hey, shoot, take them down, hey, turn them, okay, you know, and it's like you're going beyond the point of coaching. And it's there's something to be said for the emotional maturity a young kid gets when they're in that room with a bunch of bunch of just studs and there's no one in there to bail them out you know it's just you versus the other kid and you got your coaches and I think you learn to have a trust level with the coaches more so than you would if the parents were in there well yeah I mean like you learn to understand that okay I just got up you know this this kid just took me down right you don't have to look over and look at your parent and now your parent is, is mad at you right because you gave up a takedown you know what I mean? Some, so some of these kids are wrestling on eggshells out there because maybe they're afraid of, if I get taken down, my, my mom or dad might be might be mad at me. Mm-hmm. And it's like when the door is closed, your coach is only going to get mad if there's no effort, if there's no hustle. You know, But if you got taken down because you didn't win the scramble, that's understandable. But if you're getting taken down because – you're not showing no effort, then that's the difference, you know. I can't like imagine said, that kind of thing was was that wasn't overlooked in the twister room. People with no effort that that was addressed probably right away. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I tell you what, man. Some of the practices, I I don't even tell you what. Some of those practices was like college practices, and no no lie. I mean, I can just remember. Like I said, you, you know, you're working hard and you, you're about to wrestle somebody knowing that oh, man, I'm 50-50 with this kid. And he's probably thinking the same thing. And it was like the – it was the fight, right? It was like, I don't want to get taken down. I know he didn't want to get taken down because that's not what I <laughs> – because <laughs> that's not what I want to do, you know, leaving practice, you know. Mm-hmm. So when you leave practice, like you don't want to leave practice mad because you didn't get – you didn't get the takedowns or you didn't get better. So you out there, you battling for however long it takes. What about the room itself? Sorry, go ahead, man. I didn't mean to to cut you off there. Oh, that's fine. And in return, guess what? Both of you guys are getting better. You know? Right. God, dude. Well, like I was, I didn't mean to interrupt you there, but what about the room itself? What was the the actual room like back when you were there? How many full mats? Was it nice? Was it just a normal room? Full mats, man. Oh my goodness, man. So we, so we used to practice on wall mats. You know what wall mats are, right? Yeah. <laughs> that was the mat. Yeah. So we, we started out. Some sometimes we had wall mats, and sometimes we had a mat. <laughs> but I remember, yeah, I mean, and so you can imagine trying to Velcro wall mats down. And as soon as you start wrestling, they come apart, right? So guess what you have to do? Either you stop and put them back together 
But it's like I was I was just in on a takedown. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm not stopping. I'm getting this takedown. You know, and then we can stop. You know, so but you know, like I said, sometimes we practice on wall mats or there were times where we had to practice in this room and I think it was a storage room at first, but it was it was so cold up in there. You know, we had heaters and stuff in there to keep us warm. You know, and I remember my coach always saying, you don't need a nice big room to be good, to get the best out of you. You just need to come in here and work and listen and pay attention. You know, it wasn't until later where we had a, a bigger room, but it was only like two sections of a mat. Man. You know, so you got two sections of a mat with, I don't know, 30, 40 plus kids on them you know and everybody taking advantage of their it wasn't even a circle that we had it was just like okay well i got i got this amount of space man if i go off this line we got to start over so i got to make i got to make everything happen you know right here at least the mats were red i hope right oh yeah 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 okay (laughs) they were definitely red okay i mean i just don't think I don't really think the city really, really cared at the time. You know, I think it was all about basketball and football. You know, wrestling wasn't really getting the love that it needed to get, but we didn't need the love. We just needed space to practice, you know. And that's a common misconception, at least for a lot of folks, is the Harvey Twisters are actually in the city of Harvey, not – like the Chicago South Side where like Tony when he was on here he said he grew up in Inglewood area but that's actually not where the you know Harvey Twisters are in the city Harvey Illinois so did you did right. you live in that area or did you or do you live where near Tony lived and like what was like the makeup of a lot of the kids in there where they lived Yeah so I live I live uh down the street I could walk to practice I was two blocks away from uh, it was called Back then, I think it was called Harvey Park District, but now it's called Martin Luther King Park. But, yeah, I was two blocks away. So it wasn't nothing for me to get to practice. I was always there early. And and I think, like, as a kid, I don't remember, I don't know what the radius was, and I don't even know if it was a radius or people just kind of did whatever. But from, uh, but from, like, the, the practice room 50 miles around i mean mm-hmm. that that covers a lot of uh a lot of other cities you know that's a lot a, yeah. a lot of uh, uh, yeah you know a lot of other clubs <laughs> so i'm i mean cuz i'm assuming that that was the same when that it is now right 50 mile radius mm-hmm. so but uh, you know like a lot of people live around within that within that area you know I don't think people traveled two or three hours away. If they did, that that might have been because of traffic, right? Right. So, it wasn't the norm. But, it, but, you know, yeah. There were people that lived in Markham, which was the next city over. People that lived in, um, like I said, Chicago, Dalton. Um, Blue Island. Well, those cities. Blue Island, yeah. <laughs> um, Robbins. Uh, Riston, Riston Park. I mean, just all those little neighboring cities that connect with other little cities. And one of the things, you know, growing up, Steve was, was quite a bit older than you, but Joe was like three to four years older because when he was a senior, you were a freshman. What kind of impact did Joe have on you growing up and throughout your career? Yeah, so Joe Joe is two years older than me, and Steve was four. Um, I remember, and this this is gonna sound crazy, but when I was um, when I was graduating eighth grade, I didn't think I didn't think I was good enough for a class A wrestling. Right, that was my thought. That was what I was thinking at at that time, and. Eighth grade. I, I'm not good enough for double A, so I want to go to a one A. Not that that was any easier, but at the time I was just like, man, I don't know if I want to go to Mount Carmel because I'm not, 
I'm not good enough, right? Now, I was a three-time state champ coming from the Twisters, and that was my thought. I'm not good enough. You know, now, that wasn't meaning I was scared. It was just I didn't think I was good enough. Why is that, you so, think? Um, I don't know. I, I just think – I think a lot of these kids – think that sometimes that they're not good enough and mm-hmm. I, I think I thought it I think I thought that way because I don't know it's just it wasn't it wasn't like I wasn't getting the training or the competition it was just something that just came along in my in my head and I was like I'm not good enough so what you happened? Know? and I so I I I was gonna um I was gonna go to this class a school and then talking with uh, Coach Quint, and this is a person that when they tell you something, he's telling you the honest God truth. He, he won't sit up there and lie to you. And that's one thing that I love and admire about Quint. He, he's he's going to tell it like it is, whether you like it or not. So um, here's what we would do. We would go to tournaments. And he would tell me to challenge people. And I'm like, challenge? I'm a challenge this guy. Walk over there and ask that guy if you want to wrestle. <laughs> and, and and I'm like, what? Who me? Yeah, you. <laughs> so <laughs> I would go over there and ask this guy who was a state champ in two A. You know, and I'm saying, hey, you want to do a, an exhibition match? Uh, no. I'm like, so I walk away like, oh, wow, man. Okay. <laughs> I think I'm going to clear. <laughs> I go back, Quinn say, hey, go ask him again. I'm like, oh, man, I just asked him, you know? So <laughs> I would go over there and, right, I would, I would go ask him again. And the guy would say, hey, I know who you are, TJ. You're a tough wrestler. I know I'm not wrestling you. So I walk away and I'm like, Man, he, he said I was tough. So then I go tell Quinn, and Quinn say, what did he say? He said, no. He said, because you're a tough wrestler, and he didn't want to wrestle me. He said, there you go. And you saying that you're not tough? I'm like, man. He... So that taught me right there how how good I was and how I I didn't see it at the time, but somebody else told me. And then I saw it, you know, because, you know, because sometimes, you know, you, sometimes your conscious kind of play with you sometimes, you know, mm-hmm. hey, you know, maybe hey, you, you barely won that match. So you're not very tough. You didn't really beat anybody tough. So you're really not that good. So, and I think that was going through my head and maybe that's why I thought that. So then I ended up going to my Carmo. And um, so my brother had a great impact on me at Mount Carmel. He kicked my butt every day, every practice. Is it true that he used to <laughs> run before practice by himself, three miles? Yeah, he would, he would run before practice, and and I would be like, man, where is he at? <laughs> He'd come down sweating. He'd come down these stairs sweating, coming into, uh, you know, going into the practice room. I'm like, where, where were you at? I was running. And everybody was looking at him like, what are you doing sweating? I had to run before practice. I'm like, run before practice? But we, okay. So then everybody started doing it. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> if you didn't run before practice, you weren't going to have a good practice. Wow. That was kind of like the warm up, you know? But so, that's like a three mile. And like, I read that Joe said is, at first it was like him running in, in solitude, getting himself ready for the day. Then you start tagging along and, He's like, man, I had to pick up the pace to show him that this isn't a cakewalk. <laughs> and so <laughs> I yeah, can imagine. Look, <laughs> look, there was a lot of times he would leave me. You know, like we might start running together up on the track and he would just take off. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, I, I got to pick it up. So I try to pick it up. He would just keep picking it up. I pick it up. He'd keep picking it up. And next <laughs> thing you know, it's at a full sprint, <laughs> you know? 
<laughs> and then there were times where we would run from our home uh, to Quint's house. Now, for our, from our house to Quint's house was about, I don't know, I'm guessing four, three to five miles maybe. So we start out running together. Yeah, I would say he didn't just take off like he do at school. <laughs> and at the time, I was, you know, I was still kind of young. And, and and I would get scared because, you know, I didn't know where I was going. Like, I, I saw him up there in, in a distance, but I just couldn't catch up with him because he was running so fast, you know. Man, was he just that and focused I, and that driven all the time? Yeah. I mean, Joe, Joe was, yeah, he he was – if you wanted to get something done, he got it done. You know, either either you was with him, or you was considered like an enemy or something. So if you was practicing with him, and he if he felt like he wasn't getting better from practicing with you, then he would find another partner. <laughs> you know, it was kind of like kind of like, hey, so what about me? <laughs> you know, so. But me being a little brother, I'm like, I'm, I'm going to take him down. Because, you know, we would trash talk later on, you know. So I'm like, all I need is one takedown. Let me get one takedown for the day. And I know later on that night we're going to get into it, and I'm going to bring this up. <laughs> <laughs> so were you so a then, freshman and, when he was a senior then, or was I wrong on that? Yeah. You were a I was, freshman. I, I was a freshman, yeah. Okay. I was a freshman. It's funny because I, I was watching the 92 state finals, do a team state finals last last week. And it was Mount Carmel versus, was it Naperville? I want to say maybe. Okay. I could be wrong, but it was a, it was another tough school. So they had bumped Joe up to, I think, one, 160, maybe 170. I don't know. And he went out there and pinned the guy <laughs> less than like a minute. My brother Steve, they didn't want to wrestle him, so they forfeited at his weight class. But yeah, those so I was watching teams. that. God, those are great teams. Man, man, I, I tell you what. So when I was a freshman, we were ranked number two in the country. You know, as, as a freshman, I wasn't. See, like we was taught at an early age, rankings don't mean anything, right? Rankings, seedings, it don't matter who you got, state champ, national champ, just go out there and just wrestle the way you know how to wrestle. That that was instilled in us at a very young age. So at the time, I didn't, I wasn't hung up on like, oh man, wow, we're number two. I didn't even care about that. Right. You know? But but I do remember going to, so I think we were number two, and Walsh Jesuit was number one from Ohio, some mm-hmm. school in Ohio. So we, and this is the first time I, just the first time that I got I got on a plane. Our whole wrestling team, somehow they saved money, raised money, and we all flew to Ohio to wrestle in a tournament called the Midwest Classic. Now, it wasn't just a regular tournament by the points you score. Like, you score individual points, and then they tally them all up, which is kind of weird. So we went there hoping to run into the number one team. They wasn't even there, and I think that was their tournament, from my understanding. Because they started the Ironman, that that Walsh Jesuit program. That's how the Ironman tournament got started. That was probably early days Ironman tournament. Yeah, that was, I mean, well, like I said, when we went, it was 90, 93. Because I want to say Joe was, was, it was 94. Well, you're, I don't know. I was going to say, you're, when you were a freshman, the 90, I always go by like, what what was the year at the end of the year? So 93 was when state was. So your freshman year, you guys had six NCAA NCAA titles on that team. Joe had three, you had two, and Tony had one. And Tony didn't even win it because he – I don't even think he wrestled at state his freshman year because he got hurt at the uh, at the sectional. But, like, 
you look at all those teams, I was going down the message board route and just <laughs> looking at, you know, 93, 94, 95, you know, and then the state got canceled one of those years because there was yeah. that lawsuit, you know, <laughs> but, uh, right. I mean, obviously I, you guys had a dominant streak there. Then Providence took back over for six years. But I mean, when you were there, you wrestle, I mean, you wrestle for some of the great coaches all time, but Bill Wick, that's a guy who everyone's got a story on Bill Wick. I mean, he was Gable's coach in the Olympics. Um, what do you remember about coach Wick and, and those practices? Were they a lot different from the twisters or was it pretty similar? They were um, a lot different. Um, you know, Coach Wick, he would come in there in his blue sweatpants and a brown and white shirt with a cigar in his mouth. Now, the cigar wasn't lit, but it was in his mouth. <laughs> and I remember, yeah, I know, right? It's At like, high school. Guy, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, high school. But back then, it was things were totally different. You know, back then, if you got out of line, teachers or coaches can they put their hands on you if you was being disrespectful you know but but anyway so coach Wick coming there with his blue sweatpants and a brown and white shirt with a cigar in his mouth looking at the room and his favorite words were that a baby you know that a baby (laughs) you know and he would come in the room and uh, show technique. Yeah, he was still show technique at, at his age. Oh, my God. And I God. thought he wasn't, yeah. I mean, I'm like, man, this old man, he ain't very tough. And I was like, Coach, I, I, I was like, Coach, I can take you down and beat you. Yeah, I'll put you in a cradle. And he just shook his head at me like, yeah, okay. So then one practice, like, I don't know if it was weeks later or months later, he got on top of me. And I could not get up. <laughs> Man. I could not get up. I, I could not escape. I couldn't move my hips. He wrote me real hard. I was like, Coach, I, Coach, you got to show me what you're doing because this is what I need to know. <laughs> <laughs> was, and, uh, man, he's just. Was he like a guy guys trusted in and had like a special relationship with just like, just like Coach Quint? Yeah. You know, same thing with Wick. Um, you know, he, he, he demanded respect. Um, and at the time, as a kid, you know, you wanted to please your coaches and your teachers. So you did the things that you needed to do to get that to get that praise, right? But it wasn't always about winning, though, too. It, it was just about, hey, being a good person off the mat, too. Mm. But, you know, Coach Wick would, um, you know, like there was times he was upset in practice because maybe – Everybody wasn't working hard, you know. Then there was times in practice where, you know, it was a tough practice because we were working hard, <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, he was, he was a good guy, good coach. Um, I just remember some of the stories he would tell me, like, cause I I didn't know he coached Gabriel. You know, at the time, you don't the the information that you're being told. You listen, but I don't really think people process it, right? Because you're just a youngster, and you kind of like, oh, this old timer telling the story. Uh, I'm not gonna listen. <laughs> I hear it. You, you know what I mean? I hear it, but I'm not listening until it dawned on you years later, and it's like, oh my goodness, he he did that. You know, because he never bragged about what he did. Like yeah. we never knew anything about him wrestling wise. You know, we knew he was a father, a coach. And he was a teacher, you know, that's all we knew. We we didn't know that. I mean, I don't remember people telling me that he was a national champ or, oh, yeah, he coached Gable or he did this or he was on this Olympic team. It wasn't until, like, later on. And I'm like, yeah, this, man, this is my coach. Right. Wow. Right. You know? I mean, it's like um... – Half the time, you don't even know if they're telling the truth or not. People say that about J-Rob as well. I talked to guys who wrestled for him, and like when he would start spouting off about a story, you didn't know if he was telling the truth or not, but it turns out it was true. And I, I got to imagine things were pretty similar with Wick back in those days. Yeah, you know. I mean, he, he would – so, for example, Coach Wick told us a story how these two kids was trying to rob him. 
like I said, I don't know what how old he was when he was coaching. I don't know if he was 60, 70, something. So you think, you know, two kids trying to rob this older guy, they're going to take whatever they want from him. And I think he just got robbed right before he got to practice. Or he, or I guess, uh, not he didn't get robbed, but they tried to rob him. But he, he beat those two kids up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and not meaning, I mean, not, not like little kids. I'm like grown men. Yeah. And he told us a story like, had to beat these two guys up because they tried to rob me because they thought I was an old guy that I, I didn't I couldn't defend myself. Now Mount Carmel was in you know Chicago. He was on 64th and Dante. That's a bad area. You know you go two blocks west. I mean you I mean you're in a bad neighborhood. <laughs> was the I was going to ask you was the student the student body who went there though was it mostly white or is it mixed like like kind of like that neighborhood was. It was um, it was mostly white. Um, there, I mean, there was uh, there were some black kids that went there. I mean, I don't know how many, but it was. I mean, it was a big number, you know. But it was mostly mostly white, you it, know. And it was an all boys school ahead. too, right? Yeah, it was definitely an all boys school, which was. Uh, which was good for me because that's what I needed. I, I I didn't think. I think I would have got in trouble if I'd have went to a co-ed school. <laughs> you know. I, I mean, just you. not you know you know not focused. You know. People trying to get your attention. So going to Mount Carmel was a big adjustment. But at the end of the day, it was like, well, hey, I'm not trying to impress nobody. So I get to wear, you know, my three pair of pants that I would buy <laughs> and my four shirts, <laughs> you know. So I would split that up throughout the week, you know, whereas other schools, people wanted to, they wanted to impress you, you know. Right. Yeah, so it eliminated distractions and just took care yeah. of business. I mean, yeah. four-time state champ. Now, you went to JUCO right away out at Lassen. And I don't know if, like, Stoney Marchetti, if he was on those teams or if that all came later, but talk to us about the transition to JUCOs. So, um, yeah, so after graduating high school, I went to Lassen College. Um, making that transition from high school to junior college, um, I'll tell you what, those first couple months was, was real tough just because, uh, I mean, I've never been away from home. You know, I've always had my mom, um, my family, you know, my coach. So just going down there for the first couple of months, it was tough. And it was just like I had to um, I had to step out and just realize, hey, TJ, you know, you're, you're hours away from home. Matter of fact, 24 hours away from home, you're here with some people you know. So now it's all about you trying to finish school, you trying to graduate, and uh, hopefully win a um, a national title. But our room was so so tough, and we had guys from all over South Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia, Chicago, um, California, I mean Vegas. I mean you and you talk about now these all these guys were junior college wrestlers, but a lot of them went D1, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of people don't know that. So, again, I'm in a tough room where everybody's going to challenge you. Coaches are challenging you. Your teammates are challenging you. And now they talking smack, right? <laughs> you know? So now they talking smack, and it's like, hey, I'm going to take you down and pin you. And it's like, man, you saying that? And then they go out there and do it. <laughs> you know? So it was like, I was I was fortunate to be around a good club team, a good high school team, and and a good college team. You know, because people think just because you were in junior college, uh, he's not very tough. But we would go to some of these open tournaments, and uh, man, like we would kick those college guys' butt. Those D1 <laughs> athletes, you know, and and I'm for real. No, I believe I mean, coaches it. Coaches were. 
coaches were going up to my coach asking us, this kid junior college? But yeah. He's not junior college. He's a he's a division one athlete. But it's just pretty much all of us didn't have good grades coming out of high school, you know? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Well, plus with you, man, so, you got you got a target on your back. You're Joe Williams' brother. Everyone wants to get a takedown on you to talk about it. I mean, that. how much did that play into things? I, I've even read your mom had, had told people that she was worried that you know Joe might cast too big a shadow. And um, I don't know if that ever impacted you or if that was all just in the press. But was there certain times where you're like, man, I just kind of wish I was my own man? No, I just, I mean, being, at the time, being Joe's brother, it was always, it was always like people thought, I was as good as him, you know, and I was to a certain point, but we were different, different, different athletes, you know? So, but people think, oh, okay, well, he's Joe Williams, brother. He's going to win this match by a technical fall <laughs> or a pin. And I go out there and win by like one point, <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> hey, man, you Joe Williams' brother. It's like, Okay. You should have beat this kid by this many points. I said, hey, man, this kid was strong. He was good. And, you know, it was tough. So I didn't I, I, I didn't really try to put that pressure on me because I, I didn't want that pressure, right? I, I, didn't, I didn't want that pressure of being, okay, well, Joe did it, so now you got to do, do this. So I just kind of did my own thing. And then I think eventually people understood yeah, that's Joe's brother, but his his name is TJ Williams. <laughs> you know? Right. Well, plus you guys wrestled very differently. Um, I think at least from from looking at it, you you were scrambling a little bit. Doug Schwab talks about your switch. He loves your switch, man. I, I was interviewing him in January. <laughs> he goes, "That's that's to to this day the best switch." Um, and so everyone knows you went to Iowa, and, and you're the winningest wrestler in Iowa history, which just incredible. Um, but I actually didn't know this. You got second at JUCOs that year and took took some losses. What was that moment of like self reflection after you took second? It was the first time you hadn't won in seven years because you won three titles in IKWF, four in high school, and so yeah. now that had to be a tough one to swallow. And everyone's expecting you to win it and go to D one. Like, what was that moment of self reflection like after you got second at JUCOs? Yeah. So just reflecting back on that year, I tell you that I lost to Kerry Cola. <laughs> um, as a freshman at the Midlands, I lost to just throwing out some names, some tough names. Okay, I lost to Casey Cunningham twice. I couldn't get out from the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> um, he wrote me out. Uh, who else did I lose to? I lost to you know some other guys. Not to say that it wasn't tough, but you good know, guys though. Good guys. So. Um, so when I lost in the finals, I actually beat that guy. His name was Glenn Garrison. I beat him in a dual meet. And then for some reason, you know, he was he was kind of funky. He was like um, kind of like Tony a little bit. You know, just can wrestle from every position. Man, I remember just wrestling in that match, not being sure of like, Man, should I finish this shot this way? Should I finish it that way? And I'm asking myself three, three, four questions while I'm in this position. You know, and we know as a wrestler, you don't have that much time. Yeah, that ain't good. You know, so, right. You know, so I'm like, I'm basically stalling, I feel like, you know. And I end up losing a match. And I, I, I think that loss was good for me because – as I sat in this room, I, mean, I was crying, you know, I was crying. Not, not that I got beat because I lost, you know, it wasn't, I mean, there's a difference, right? It, it wasn't. So the difference is he didn't kick my butt. I, I kind of beat myself. That's why I was crying, you know? Um, but I remember sitting in this room talking to one of the older twisters. His name was Raphael Kizzy. And I remember sitting in there in this room, because he went to Iowa Central. And I remember sitting in there saying, I'm not going to lose another match. I said, I promise, I promise I'm not going to lose another match. I hate this feeling. It don't feel good. And 
And he was just kind of kind of consoling me like, yeah, yeah, you know, I understand. And I meant that, you know. And then I transferred to Iowa, and I didn't lose a match for, what, two, three years, actually. No, two and a half years. Because my sophomore year at, at Lassen, I redshirted. I was 20 and 0. And I think people don't – see, people think my best year was when I won nationals. I think my best year was when I was undefeated my sophomore year in junior college. Really? You know, yeah. I, I mean, because I saw, I saw my personal growth as a competitor, as an athlete. You know, because after losing that match, I went back. You know, and people, you know, people celebrated because we won it as a team. I, I didn't. I didn't celebrate. I went to the, my room and laid down. You know, yeah. I, I mean, I just, I mean, that didn't, that didn't sit well with me. But then that following week, I was in the wrestling room working on my shots, working on positioning, working on how to move this guy, how to put him in there, how to put him in this position if I want this shot. You know, how how to, you know, create more angles, how to hit more shots. So that sophomore year is when I put all that work in, and I end up winning uh, the Michigan State Open, uh, Michigan State. State Open, the Portland State Open, the Southern Oregon Open, the Wisconsin Open. Every tournament I went to, I won it. And I remember getting OW at Michigan State, you know, and, I, and I'm and i at this tournament hitting low singles, and people are like, I didn't know you know how to do a low single. I said, I didn't either. <laughs> but my team, you know, but you're dealing with all these kids on your team from different different states who were good at different things. Plus, those so California was, kids um, have a way of wrestling, man. I always thought California kids were tough to wrestle like that, and you're dealing with them every day yeah. out there. Well, we had – I was teammates with Jamil Kelly, you know. So he was he was on my team in, in junior college. Wow. Uh, Paul Go, – you know, Paul Gomez. I mean, I'm talking these guys, and these guys, I don't even think they won a state title in Cali because it was just one class. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. But they both went, you know, Paul went to Nebraska. Jamil went to uh, Oklahoma State. So you talk about just those two for a second. I'm I'm picking their brain, you know, pick, pick, picking their brain. Hey, Jamil, show me how you do a low single. Paul, show me how you do a low single. Hey, show me that California funky stuff. <laughs> so I'm learning, you know, and I'm like, man, I don't know if I like this, but I was learning it. And I think that year. Um. It taught me a lot as a as a person that if you want to get something done, you got to go out there and you got to wrestle. No matter how you feel, no matter if you lost to this person before, you got to go out there and get your points. Don't hold back. And that's what I did. And I'm not taking my national title away that I won in 99. But I was already, um, I was already going into Iowa's room with, with, with that hunger. But it was that sophomore year of junior college that um, that I saw that personal growth that I needed to see in myself. Dude, it just reminds me. I think every young person should have to do something where they go away for their family for two years at that age and just kind of make it on their own. You know, I think there's something to be said you, for that. You know what? Um, I believe you're absolutely right. I think a lot of these kids, and this is my personal opinion, because now I, I can sit back and, and, and see things a little different. Like you said, I, I think every kid, yeah, you want to go to Division One, D2, D3, NAIA, or wherever you want to go, you should go two years at junior college, you know, mm-hmm. at a community college or something. Now, you don't, you don't have to wrestle both years or com- compete in both years, but maybe just one to figure out where you think you fit in that uh, because it's tough. It is tough in division one wrestling, man. It is. It, I mean, now I'm just looking at it. <laughs> I mean, and I've been looking at it since I left Iowa. I mean, it is, I mean, there's a lot of kids that go D one. Either they get hurt or they go to the wrong program. Or 
they don't they don't love it no more. They fall out of love with it. Mm-hmm. You know, a bad experience, bad coaching. You know, and and then they don't never finish what they started. Did you ever you know, come close I, to falling out of love with it? No, I mean, I mean, there was times I wanted my breaks. I wanted to be a kid and and do what kids do, hang out with you know your friends and stuff. But I also wanted to win. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, I wanted to win, so I, I I made that sacrifice. And when I made that sacrifice, I realized, hey, my true friends are all my teammates. All the people that I train with, right? Because that's who I talk to to this day now is is the people that I train with, the people that I was on teams with. Who then are I some got of your my other in Iowa? Of, who are some of your your buddies there? Um, uh, Schwab, Zadik, Jurgens, Strip Matter. I mean, West Hand, all those guys. Um. I mean, I mean, those were my teammates, so we hung out together. You know, we, we did everything together. You know, I, I remember Mike Zadick and I, we uh, we would go shooting. <laughs> and <laughs> Mike Zadick, <laughs> I'll tell you what, Mike Zadick, I mean, when you say his name, you got to laugh because, because you never know what to expect. But we went, we went to go shoot, and I'm thinking he's going to have, like, three or four guns, right? He put 20 to 30 guns on the table. And I look at him like, hey, Mike, who, who are you going to war with? <laughs> oh, no, no, man. These are some of the guns that I just collect. I said, collect? I said, this is a, I said, man, is this legal? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but so we ended up shooting guns and I shot every gun he had. And it was, it was fun, you know? Mm-hmm. And then I would go out to this place in Montana. We would do a camp out there and then go go camping. So you stay with the Zaddix out in Montana, huh? Yeah, I stay with the Zaddix. I tell you what. <laughs> that night I went camping. I was I was I was uh, I was scared. I'm not gonna lie, I was scared. That was the first time in my life I went camping outside. I've still never mountain. been camping in a tent, dude. Never. <laughs> I tell you what, I, listen, I, I wasn't in a tent. <laughs> I was I was on the ground just in a sleeping bag. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> no. Yeah, so I'm it was uh ironically, it was uh it was Zadik. It was Mike and Bill and it was uh Arska Wood. And myself, so we, you know, we went up to the cabin, their their cabin. We went fishing, went shooting and stuff, and just you know having a good time. So I'm like, well, where are we gonna sleep at? No, no, we gonna sleep outside. I'm like, why would we sleep outside when there's a cabin right there? No, this is how we do it. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, okay, all right. Um, so where's the tent? No, I just lay in the sleeping bag. I'm like, oh, okay, well, all right, well, I, okay, well, you guys know what to do because you've done it before. So then I noticed we're getting ready to go to bed, and I'm like, Mike got his gun, Bill got his gun, Oscar got his gun. I'm like, I'm like, hey, guys, what about me? <laughs> oh, you get a knife. <laughs> I get a knife. A knife? I mean, what happens if a bear attacks me? Well, just stab the bear. I'm like, dude. No. That way. ain't gonna work. <laughs> I was like <laughs> I was like, man, listen, listen, listen. I'm from I'm from the city. We don't have to run from no bears or fight no animals like that. So I don't feel comfortable. <laughs> you know, and I wasn't comfortable. But I made it through the night. Uh, I mean, I heard all types of noises that I'd never heard before. But I was I was ready to get out of there in the morning. As soon as, <laughs> as soon as daylight hit, I was ready to get up out of there. Dude, that's so funny. I know uh, I know we've been going about an hour, and I, I can hear kids in the background, but there's two more things i got to ask you about if you've got another 10 minutes, TJ. Yeah, I per- do. Perfect, perfect. So 
one of the questions we got online was, you know, what was your first practice at it like at Iowa? Or, you know, I, I'm just curious in general of of the intensity level and the work level of those Iowa practices, mainly because you had been in some intense rooms already. But, I mean, your whole career was a, was a progression of transitions, pr- transitioning to to Mount Carmel, to JUCO, and then to Iowa. You're at the highest level. And I've heard you say that there you went beyond even your furthest limits, man. Talk to us about some of those workouts where you really, really went beyond what you thought was possible. So my first practice at Iowa, I was actually wrestling Doug Schwab. That's what I was practicing. I think I was practicing. I was practicing with him and Bill Zanuck. And I'll tell you what, man, those guys got me so tired. Um. I mean, it was back and forth, back and forth. And I'm wrestling these guys, thinking like, man, these guys going to take a break? <laughs> yeah, I know we take breaks, you know, but um, they didn't they didn't take a break. So I ended up like, all right, I'm, I'm taking a break. I got to use the restroom. So I walk in, um, walk in the locker room and use the restroom. I was kind of walking in there kind of normal. And then I turn a the corner, then I just – fell on the floor because I was so, you know, out of shape, breathing heavy. I was gassed out, right? That, that's that's what happened. Man. So from that moment on, so from that moment, from that moment on, I realized I was like, oh, this is what I need to be. I got partners like that that's going to push me. Um, That's going to help me get better. You know, that's going to, hey, bring – Bring it, bring it every practice. So I had partners like that, I had Tom Brands, Terry Brands, Zaleski, Mark Ironside, McGinnis, not to mention my teammates. I mean, I was I was with the cream of the crop. Did you ever wrestle with Ironside? Um, I didn't I didn't wrestle with him. But um, he was around though. Yeah. Hold on for a second real quick. Yep. I apologize. So you get to Iowa, you, you have this transition, you're you're rocking and rolling. I actually heard your first match was against Sanderson. Is that right? Yeah, my first match, yep, it was against uh my first home home uh home duel. Home meet. duel. Yeah. Yeah. So And Sanderson Go ahead. San, Sanderson uh S- Sanderson beat me the year before at the US Open down in uh Orlando, I want to say. <laughs> So I had some redemption on my mind. And as we know, you never lost to him or anyone else except, and I, I won't even mention the man's name, but the Boise State wrestler. He shall, <laughs> he, he who shall be named. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I mean, it, it's okay. Oh, man. It's all right. So you you go undefeated. You're part of that team that wins it in 99 against all odds because everyone thought Minnesota might edge you guys out, but you guys won it. But, dude, before we get there, your finals – you got another Harvey Twist or Tony Davis. Dude, what were you thinking throughout that tournament knowing you guys might meet up? Man, honestly, I was thinking, I hope he get beat. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I hope he could I hope he get beat and maybe he can take third place. <laughs> that way we don't have that way we don't have to wrestle. Because I I just know how Tony is. You know, I've I've watched him. I watched him beat some tough wrestlers and I watched him just go out there and just, uh, you know what? I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that and make it look easy and still beat some tough wrestlers. So I was like, man, I, I can't make any mistakes with him. That was my first thought. You know, I mean, I, 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 I mean, honestly, I was like, man, I hope he loses. Then I was like, I don't hope he loses. You know, if it's meant to be, I see him in the finals, you know, um, but we never really spoke a lot during the tournament. It was just doing those weigh-ins. He was, I would see him. He would say, what's up? And I would say, hey, what's up? And the following day, hey, what's up? What's up? Then the last day, it's like, hey, what's up? <laughs> you know, so going into that match, my, my thought was um, stay in good position. Don't take any unnecessary bad shots. Cause he will, he will, he will catch you and get you. 
And you had to know yeah. in the back of your mind, like how the goes used to go in high school or middle school. Like, would you say they were pretty even, or did he get the better of you in the early days? No, I was always bigger than Tony, so we never really, I never really wrestled Tony a whole lot. If he was always little, you know, he, he was always smaller than me. Mm-hmm. So, I, I mean, I wouldn't even say I wrestled him a lot in um, kids' club or even high school. You know, maybe a handful of times in practice, but I mean, not, not to, not to the point of me remembering, like, not to the point of me me remembering uh, every every practice we had together. So he, because he was always what 10 15 pounds smaller okay you know so when he was um it's funny because we were supposed to wrestle earlier that year i was supposed to wrestle tony at the at the uh the north no at the omaha open and he lost in a semi-finals i think to an injury or something so then i was supposed to wrestle him at the northern open and he still was injured so I was like, well, I say my nationals if, if it's meant to be. Man. But I just knew that, yeah, I just knew that, you know, and my coach all 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 year long was just, you know, there were some practices where he felt like I wasn't going hard enough. And he was just mentioning his name. <laughs> you know, it was like, hey, Tony Davis said, uh, let me tell you hi. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, you know, just to get under my skin. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. All right, so then I respond, you know. Right. So all year long I had motivation, but it wasn't just about being Tony. It was about me winning a national title and not let not let nothing stand in my way. But I just knew with Tony, like I said, specifically, you can't get out of position. You can't take bad shots. Um, you can't ex- expect to him – you can't expect for him to be tired and not attack because he's going to come at you with, with everything. So um, I was like, man, I just got to be, I just got to be patient, relaxed and, and, and just be focused, be dialed in, you know? So they hit, they hit both of us with a double stalling. I saw that. In the first period. Yeah, I was, and I was like, oh, they want us to, they want us to do more, right? Because they, because people wanted us to, people wanted that match to be explosion, high of, scoring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and 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 I was like, you know what? I'm gonna go up there and wrestle the way that I want to wrestle, and the way I've been wrestling all year. And I think everybody wanted more explosion, more, you know, the oohs and ahs. So they hit us with a double stalling, and I was like. Oh, I, I know they're going. I know they're going to get one of us again in the third period. Mm-hmm. I just know it. I just know it. And it was me. So they got me for the stalling, but I was trying to set him up for a shot. So as they called me for stalling and gave him one, I was going in for a takedown. I saw that. And I got that. Yeah. And I got that takedown, and he tried to do a, a funky roll out of it. Then I, I think I just stayed in my position versus moving up right away and then I end up scoring that takedown and I rolled him out and tell you what that that was one of the hardest matches that I ever had in college had to be just because it was yeah just because it was you know I mean that was my best friend growing up and Tony and I was together like every day as people don't understand that you know and I don't mean just best friend because we was on we was on the same uh, teams together. No, we we did some of the same stuff together in the summers, you know, fishing, skating, hanging out, or watching wrestling and wrestling. Like actual you friends, know. yeah. Yeah, actual friends, not just teammate friends. Mm-hmm. So, um, and and after that match, I said, "Hey, man, I love you." He said, I love you too, and, and that was that. Man. Just so, the, but, the odds of it happening over all those years, because you guys both went JUCO and 
kind of found your way there. And next thing you know, in the finals, it's just crazy to think about. Um, well, I'm, I'm glad we talked about it because that was something that I knew at, at – when I was a kid, I remember two things. I remember the year you and Joe met in the finals of the Midlands, and your mom made you guys both forfeit. And then I remember uh, the year you and Tony wrestled in the finals of the Nationals, and I was just dying to ask you about it. Yeah, I'm trying to wait a minute. The year Joe and I made it to the finals. Of the Midlands. Do you remember that? I, I think that might have been. No, I don't think that was me, was it? I thought for sure it was like 2000, 2001, and I – I remember my dad used to tape the Midlands every year, and he's like, dude, boys, one of the best college tournaments in the world happens about three hours away from us, and he'd tape it. Because um, I remember the one year you wrestled Bono, and he beat you, but then one of the years, I thought for sure, I could be wrong, that you and Joe met in the finals, and you just kind of like double forfeited, so to speak. I could be wrong, though. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, man. I'll have to look at that one because if yeah, that's the case, I got to go. I got to go do some research. Because if that's the case, I really start to question what else I know. Because in my mind, that happened real as day. And if that didn't happen, I'm concerned for what else didn't happen. <laughs> well, 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 let's just say it happened. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah. Now, a couple things from the audience. These are real quick. Um, yeah. When you were at Iowa, who was the bigger rival, Oklahoma State or Minnesota? I think. Man, that's a good question. Um, I think Minnesota because they were in a big, you know, because they were in the Big Ten, right? They were in our conference, and we saw them, you know, do a meet conference and maybe some other tournaments. And plus, I, I felt like, you know, Jay Robinson left Iowa. I felt like that was, that was, you know. There's, him trying to do his own yeah. thing, but I, but I felt like, all right, well, this is our rival. Okay, all right. Hey, why we don't like these people? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I never I, I never really understood why we didn't like these other teams. <laughs> I just understood, all right, I'm going to go out there and do my job. Right. You know? Okay. But I would definitely say Minnesota. Yeah, I, Minnesota. especially during that time, man. It was it was nasty. And then in 2001, when it was at Carver and Minnesota won, oof, it doesn't get uh, any tougher than that. Man, that that was I, – I think Minnesota scored more points than the Russellbacks. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if they changed the point system or what, but I just – I don't know if they said that you get more points now in the roster backs than you do if you move forward. I don't know. I, I was, I was, I was confused, you know? I remember. I yeah. That they want, they went like unbelievable streak of wins in the wrestle back. Um, <clears throat> they had like, you know, obviously 10 all Americans that year and you guys had a pretty good semi round, but then they, uh, you know, they had some wrestlebacks, and everyone just kind of came. I mean, they had a lot of guys winning the wrestlebacks, and they had 10 guys come through, which that's never happened before. Yeah. And yeah, that was, uh, no, that was, that was heartbreaking because that was my senior year. And, you know, I, I wish we would have got it done, at, you know, going out, going out with a, with a W like that, right? Mm -hmm. With a team and individually. All right. Here's, here's another one that, I thought was pretty funny, so I wanted to add in here. Do you take credit for being the first Iowa wrestler to rock the volleyball knee pad <laughs> back in uh back in your day? <laughs> I, I don't you know what? I don't even know. I just remember that's what I picked up from uh being in California. Because okay. I think Jamil Kelly I think you Jamil Kelly used to wear Jamil Kelly and like I said, Paul Gomez I think those guys used to wear those knee pads. I'm like, man, that's a volleyball knee pad. So I, I remember, like, man, I'm, I'm not gonna wear that. I'm like, but they said, hey, it's 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 a good cushion. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> but I don't need that. So when I put it on, and I was like, oh my goodness, this is I can shoot more, <laughs> you know. So <laughs> I don't know what other teammate had it at Iowa, but all I know was it was comfortable. And it was definitely a good cushion. 
I'm also giving you credit for the first yellow headgear too, man. I got that yellow headgear as soon as I saw you wearing it because everybody else just wore the black, and I was like, let's spice it up a little bit. And you you rocked the yellow <laughs> that year. <laughs> See, I, I just was like, to me, I just kind of not not that I want to be different, but I like what I like, right? It, it was because I used to wear a red hat. It's called. It was the name on his hat said Red Cloud. And I used to wear that. And if you watch some of the, the dual meets, you'll see me wearing this red hat. Like the beanie, and right? I, With I, the palm on the top? Yeah. 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 And uh, I, I think my brother gave it to me. So I was like, all right, this hat going to this hat going to mean every time I put it on, I'm bringing the pain. <laughs> you know, at the time, that, I mean, that's what I thought. I was like, every time I put this hat on, somebody's going to pay. But all the hard work that I did that I didn't like, but it benefited me. You still got the hat? Yeah, I, I still got it. No way! <laughs> oh, you got to send yeah, me a picture I, I of it after this. Uh, after this, is this this call here? Because that was the that was I the will. hat you wore in the. Uh, you know, how, like at the at the Division One Nationals where they show a headshot of each guy before the finals. You had yeah. that red one on there, and I'm like, God, dude, that he he does have his own style going on. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, that hat, man. Yeah, that that was my lucky hat, and. I still got it. I mean, I, it's put up. I, I still got it, though. I get it for you and take a picture in it. Yeah, please do. Um, <laughs> and this is the uh, this is the last one, man. So obviously, the name of this podcast is called "Wrestling Changed My Life." Everyone who's wrestled can agree it's impacted them in some way. So, question for you is: How would you say wrestling's impacted your life, or what's the biggest change you've noticed through uh, wrestling after all these years? I think wrestling changed my life because it kept me out of um, it kept me out of trouble. You know, not not saying that I would have got in trouble, but I was so caught up in wrestling, and that was that was what my time was occupied at. You know, and it um, you know wrestling took me from state to state across the country, met some great people some good relationships that I have with coaches and athletes, teammates, and even competitors. Um, you know, but most importantly, I, I think it taught me that everybody that is a competitor has the same mindset, you know, because when you have these rivals at the time that we were just talking about, you know, you don't really talk with these wrestlers when you're at a dual meet. It's not until later on you sit down and you have a conversation with them and you understand, hey, you know, we got the same mindset. We were kind of the same, you know, mindset and we had good coaches and and that's what that kind of taught me, that, hey, you know, there's a lot of people that are alike in this sport. Mm -hmm. Whether we like to believe that or not, you know, not and it's not all about when, you know, because we all want to win at the end of the day. I wish I would have got that third national title, you know, but but maybe it was something bigger that taught me something different. Well, know? especially and now that you're that coaching was... at Tremont. There's got, I mean, if you if you won all of them, the guys are going to be like, Coach, I can't even relate to you because you literally never yes. lost in college. <laughs> yeah, but, but you're absolutely right, and, and that's what I tell my athletes. It's like, hey, guys, I know what it feels like. Because these guys only know what they saw outside the wrestling room, right? They said, well, Coach, you were two-time this, you won Big Tens, you did this, you did that. I said, but you don't know my struggle that was in the wrestling room. You, know, you don't know that I felt like I wasn't good at times. You don't know that I quit for one year. You don't know that I was, I was about to just be done with wrestling. When did you quit? I quit um, – when I was younger, like, okay. I quit for one year. Okay. Just because I felt like uh, it was tough and I wasn't getting it right. So I was like, I, you know, I, you know, how kids are. I quit, yeah. and I, I really quit. So for that whole year, who was I trying to hang out with? My teammates. And my mom and my coach was like, "No, no, you quit. So you can't hang out with nobody." <laughs> you know. So I'm like. You talk about being bored and running your head through a wall. That was the toughest year of my wrestling career, just because I quit that one year. 
So the following year was like, I'm never going to quit again. Wow. So, but yeah, that was yeah that was when I was younger. So. Well, TJ, it's been an absolute honor, man. Like I said, I still have a, a pair of yellow headgear that you signed back when I was in middle school, and, and dude, it, it's awesome just to come full circle and chat with you here. So I greatly appreciate your time today, man. Hey, man, no problem, Ryan. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you called, and I definitely appreciate the conversation. And all great things must come to an end. If you want to hear more from the podcast, text WRESTLE to 555-888. That's WRESTLE to 555-888. You can also find us on Instagram, Wrestling Changed My Life, Twitter, Ryan underscore N underscore Warner, as well as our website, WrestlingChangeMyLife.com. Take care, y'all. Come. 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 Take care, y'all. Come.